course, Bobby Davis uh, didn't like our very first guest because it cost him uh, the coaching job down oh. at Geelong. And when I told Tony Shaw who was coming up as our oh. second guest, he got even more irate. Did now, he? Tony, have, can you settle down? It's, it's a long time ago. I was 10. I was 10. Ago. I was behind the goals at the MCG. And even then, I wanted someone to knock this bloke out. But and you're only 10? I was 10. It was pretty aggressive thinking from a 10-year-old reservoir boy, Dave. <laughs> it must have been 1970 then, surely, yeah, wasn't it? Back, yeah, uh, you go ahead, KB. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's welcome our very, very special guest. Certainly part of grand final history. Teddy Hopkins joins us from the Carlton Football Club. Teddy, uh, uh, welcome. Pleased to be here. And I've actually got to thank uh, Tony a lot because... Oh. Um, <laughs> You know, he led Collingwood to that uh, memorable 1990 grand final. Yeah. And my life improved noticeably after that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was pretty bleak for a long while. <laughs> Ted, everyone knows about the grand final, but we want to get your perspective of it because there's been a lot of stories about that grand final. We've had Ron Barassi in that chair and he's told us stories, Harry. He decided to put Teddy Hopkins onto the ground. But where did it all start for Ted Hopkins? Where'd you come from? <laughs> well, um, look, like a lot of uh, players that time, you, you, you know, you, you were pretty handy in the country. You got recruited into the club. Yeah. Uh, there were long lists. You worked through the seconds. Uh, you know, you played uh, an awful lot of football with the Bruce Duels, the Barry Armstrongs. Uh, we all went around a lot in the twos. And then you'd get the occasional... Um, uh, opportunity to uh, test the seniors and they, they'd run you off the bench when they had yeah. this rule that you couldn't sort of have the um, Where'd you come on, Ted? replacement. Where did you come from? Mowie, Yeah, Mowie. Uh, look, I was in the last year before um, uh, it was, was basically free agency before zoning oh, okay. and it was just fantastic because... Um, How many you, clubs approached the Teddy? Uh, about four or five yeah. and um, it was really between Carlton and Essendon in the end and, you know, I had fond, um, uh, you know, fond thoughts of Essendon. Uh, you know, I had a lot of respect, especially, you know, you've just had Ted Fordham on the oh, program. Yeah, but, yeah. like, uh, you know, as a kid, my father used to bring me to the occasional, um, you know, VFL game and he'd say, you sit here and you watch these particular players because that's how you'll learn. Was so there a football background? Oh, yeah, yeah, like... Was uh, you, you in your family, did no, you? No, 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 no. No? Just, just uh, on my mother's side, some very handy footballers up in the Wimmera kept winning premierships for Minyup. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Um, no, um, yeah, so really the, um, if you like, the, uh, the natural sporting intuition came, I think, through my mother's yeah. side. My father, he, he got very interested and helped me, you know, think st strategically. And you all know now that I, I do this stats and analysis. And I think that's got a bit of a background. I attribute that to my father. Uh, Was your father an academic? Because you're something of an academic, really. Oh, no, you? no, a realist and a strategist, you know, <laughs> academic. Oh, academic. academic. <laughs> but, but, but you, what, I tried to you deny had, that. You had some big degree at one stage. Oh, yeah, well, look, oh, I... You still got it, yeah, No, no, but I mean... A Bachelor of Science. It went out of the football yeah. world very <laughs> quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They don't yeah, take it off you, Bob. They don't take it off you, Bob. You're not taking it off, but that's what I mean. Now, we should get back to Maui, you know. So who did you look at? You wouldn't be too good as a Bachelor. Science in Maui, I Your father said, go and look at footballers. Who did you look at? Well, I think one of my great inspirations was the, uh, the Essendon half-back line. That's Epers, uh, Sheldon and... Um, Barry Davis? Barry Davis. Barry Davis. Barry Davis. And I think they yeah, were the, almost the inventors of modern football because you just looked at that team and they just swept off half-back so beautifully, you know, or they could strip the ball off you. Uh, my father took me to Hawthorne, you know, the old Glenferry Oval, yeah. and he said, son, you know, all you've got to do is just look at one player, right, uh, John Kennedy. And he says, he hasn't got much talent, but you just watch what he does, and it was just terrible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, his elbows here, and, of course, you know, the, the first game I ever played in... Oh, no, my first game against Hawthorne was in the reserves, and, you know, first thing, you, you know, you got grabbed by the nuts. And <laughs> <laughs> so my father taught me something. <laughs> who, who was the recruiting officer for Carlton? Because, obviously, Ron Barassi was the coach, because you, your first year was 1968, so who was the gun recruiter that went up there and finally got you? I knew got Chandler, you? who may have been mentioned, you know... Yeah, he was, uh, he was a very good recruiter. I mean, oh, yeah. yes, and, and Soapy Valance. Um, uh, Soapy look, came up, the former great full forward. Oh, yes. So they used him as part of the recruiting network, did they? Oh, yes. And yeah. Look, th that's my contention that, um, 
that's why certain clubs um, have done very well over the journey, you know, the Collingwoods, the Carlton's, the Essendon's, because uh, they had much deeper um, recruiting networks um, out in the community. Um, see, when I was um, a kid, I was passionate about South Melbourne, like, South you know, Melbourne. Uh, really passionate. Um, you know, I had my picture taken with Bobby Skilt, it was on the front page and that. Like, this was when I was in the Sun Kick, mm. you know, 12, 12 years of age. And Did you win the Sun Kick? Uh, oh, yeah. No, no, I got close. Though. I was oh. the youngest ever um, representative at that time. I was about 11 years old and I was in the Sun Kick. So, uh, anyway, the story is, you know, you, you'd sort of cry a lot because, you know, <laughs> South Melbourne... Didn't uh, win a <laughs> <didn't win> lot. <laughs> they didn't win a lot of games. <laughs> you look forward to the uh, the Lakeside Premiership because that was your big That's right. event yeah. of the year, you know, <laughs> St Kilda versus... <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and you'd focus on those great players like Skilton and Clegg and Freddie Goldsmith, and that's how you um, sort of followed the game. But, you know, uh, what I soon learnt, you know, when I uh, was ready to get recruited, is South Melbourne, they did... It's almost like you had to invite them to have a run with them. They just yeah. didn't have the culture, mm. the success, and the recruiting networks, mm. whereas Carlton, uh, in the Barassi era, with you know, the Chandlers and the Valances, they were always there. You were taken to dinner. You met, you know, all the famous players. Um, it made a big difference, and that's mm. really how I got to Carlton. Not because of any um, um, particular passion I had at that stage. Oh. It was just for the, if you like, the the experience of being more aligned with the success that yeah. would, uh, club that would teach you more. Oh. So, how did you find Ron Barassi, a young boy <coughs> coming down from Maui? There's no. the great Ron Barassi. Now, I played against Ron as a young boy uh, when I first started in 65. And, uh, and Ron, of course, uh, I played against Ron when he was captain and coach of Carlton. Now, he was pretty explosive on the football field, Ron, and he was, he was very vocal, and Ron may not like this, but he was very abusive on the football field. Oh, yeah, to and players and to opposition uh, players, he was very, very... You know, abusive in in, in his uh, in his manner. So here's a young boy who's come down from from Murray. You can't believe that about Ron today, can you? Because he's meek and mild. Yeah. But how did you find him? <laughs> oh yes, I, I think that on the one hand is all that uh, which is well known, the inspiration, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the motivation. But uh, I attribute uh, he's more um, he had more influence through his uh, extreme sort of uh, defensive tactics and, yeah, it's severe abuse because, like, I, I, I got to sort of abuse just something awful. It was just the most <laughs> unfair, uh, like... And, uh, what about it? You're a, uh, unfair oh, in was, the workplace. How, how did he attack? Like, was it your attack on the ball or because you're pretty yeah. small? Like, you're not going to be a physical, totally physical player. Oh, that wasn't you, was yeah. it? You were more the will-of-the-wisp sort of player. Did he like that or didn't like that? Uh, no, um... Uh, like, I, I quite often think that coaches do tend to have yeah. a natural affinity for like types. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, uh, look, he, he had a great amount of respect for me. There's no doubts about that. But, you know, quite often, you know, it was the in and under player, like he, he more was like himself, you know. Mm. And I think... Uh, so I often feel about the grand final that, you know, the, the selectors would have had a choice, you know, between a Bert Thornley who was sort of really built yeah. strongly, uh, hard nut, um, or myself, you know, who's more flair, faster player. And uh, that's what I think the selectors of Brassi would have weighed up. Um, I had a reputation for reading the play pretty well, coming on um, and doing quite well, you know, in the limited game time you had then. So it was always a fair bet that I could maybe um, do well. How many games you played that year in 1970 for Carlton? You, I think you only played I, I, 29 or 30. Yeah, well, I played, I think, 29 in my total career over four years with yeah. Carlton, as I say, most in the reserves, but um, getting the occasional run and then getting on and, you know, you yeah. get a full game occasionally and you might do well and then as a youngster you couldn't keep the pace up. You know, you're playing against, uh, well, at that time against <laughs> Hungary over here. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what, what you soon learn is, you know, these, uh, you know, these buggers were... Um, not just talent, but they were very passionate and oh. committed, you see, and uh, uh, you had to do a lot of work to keep up because, uh, especially in your, you know, your, your youngster Young, years, yeah, and that's yeah. what they find especially now. Especially Carlton, too, because you had a great small mm. man uh, fleet, didn't yeah. you? They just oh, got yeah. amazing. A a Gallagher was there. Yeah, the Gallagher, Gallagher. Um, who else was there? Roddy Ashfield, he been... No, 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 he wasn't there, there but, um, look, it, it really was um, uh, a great ruck division, which was... 
what I learned from Carlton. You know, they for many years they always had premier ruckmen that looked mm. after small men, mm. and it was a good combination. We well, had Big Nick, and you had Percy Jones, and yeah. you know, Sylvain was there, and, and Fitzpatrick and then was Madden. there. It's, it's been a great tradition of Carlton to have ruck and rover strength, um, and uh, I often think that's a blueprint that uh, you know maybe the recruiters or just through. Uh, Good luck. They um, they carried through for many many years, and of course that's what they don't have now um, mm. is necessarily mm. that um, yeah, premier ruck and rover combination, which I identify with Carlton. You know, if I think of Essendon of, of the mid '60s, I think of the halfback flank. Mm. Um, if I think of other teams, you know, they have certain characteristics, and um, mm. you know that's what we do with the stats now, and you know we try and sort of just look at the the personalities, the profiles, the signatures of players and teams, yeah. We'll take a short break here, Ted. We'll come back. Uh, we'll, we'll find out exactly what did take place at halftime in that grand final in 1970, Absolutely. your recollection of it. And then also we'll move through to what you do these days with champion data. I mean, everything's champion data this, uh, in this day and age. All the stats uh, in football come from yourself. Mm. Also, uh, the AFL Prospectus, uh, which is a book that you've got out that every player, everything he's done from Every handball, every kick, every time he scratches himself, Bob, he's in the AFL prospectus. So we'll come back, we'll have a chat about that. That's so put only on, on the field, Kevin. It's only it? on the field, Bob. Oh, okay. Put on your hat, <laughs> your, your thinking hat, and uh, go back in memory lane, because we want to know exactly what did take place, what conversations took place at half time of the 1970 grand final. Back with Teddy Hopkins. Welcome back. Teddy Hopkins has joined us. Now, Ted, we're all sitting here. Tell us what happened at half time in 1970. <laughs> well, there's... Look, I think, um, as you would expect, the players, uh, big spray coming here, you know, like <laughs> Barassi was famous for some uh, dreadful things at half times, like I can remember once, um, uh, you know, we did appallingly <laughs> well against Hawthorne or something, he comes in at half time, the oranges and the drinks are laid out on the table and he just, you bastard, you don't deserve a drink or an orange, and he just turns the whole table up, you know, <laughs> and so we go out in the second half dehydrated. So. <laughs> Did you win, so, Ted? So, did, did you, you win, win that day? No, no, he got belted by it. <laughs> <laughs> that worked. Uh, but, um, yeah, the, I, so, um, so there's the expectation. And I think there was, you know, an awful amount of initial grief. But it, the surprise was, I, I think it was focus. And uh, I was told pretty quickly I was on, given no instructions. And uh, I wasn't part of the first half, so I didn't have to necessarily take uh, responsibility what I understood uh, through my training um, and through the obligation and, and the respect they'd given to me at half time. I said, well, I was responsible for the second half. Mm. So what you're saying and, to and us, I just, is that During that half time, I do not remember too much. I didn't listen to Barassi, didn't mention it. It's about preparing myself uh, for the responsibility I'd been given. But he did told you, actually, he, oh, sorry, did, sorry Kevin, you go ahead, Bob. He told you as soon as they came in after the second quarter finished that you were going to be on. Yeah, very you quickly. Knew, you knew very quickly. Yeah. So you prepared yourself then. That's right, because look, yeah. uh, you knew, like, uh, you knew your strengths and weaknesses. I, I, I think good players do, and I, I sort of feel I, I'd sort of earned my stripes through, you know, getting a, a getting gig in into the, the grand team. final, but also previous games I'd play. And um, I know that Barassi respected a lot of the, if you like, the energy I played with, the speed I played with. So that was my responsibility to go out there and bring speed and energy to the team because it looked um, flat, uh, very slack. Mm. Ted, who played on you that? You looked like you'd be Tully, on your own Tully, a lot. I think. Uh, who was oh, on you that day? Yeah, I think it was Tully. Uh, but look, even that didn't really um, interest me that much. Uh, you know, I was there it's to get the footy. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, cut the lines, read the play. You know, not actually, you know, spend any time getting. I really had to make a standing start straight up, and I, I knew that intuitively. Um, I can talk about it sort of logically now, but I think that's basically what happened. Um, ignore the coach, ignore what anybody <laughs> says. <laughs> and do it your <laughs> way. Yeah. When it was all unfolding in that third quarter, and all of a sudden Teddy Hopkins uh, kicks a goal, then all of a sudden Teddy Hopkins kicks two goals, and then Teddy Hopkins kicks three goals. I mean, did you think, I've got to pinch myself here. What's happening? I mean, I'm, I'm killing them. <laughs> Look, um, like you've all played in, you know, big games and, you know, it's so different, you know, the, the sounds and that 
you know, they sort of just blur into the background because when you're playing well, you can see the lace on the ball. Mm. That's right. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, were T.W. Sure you were hot. You were hot. You were hot as soon as you yeah. come onto the field. Yeah, well, that was my job. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you, like last year, Nick Davis kicks a goal against Geelong to get into the grand final when his, his opponent wasn't goal side and blocking him from goal. You probably kicked three goals from being goal side of your opponent against Collingwood in that grand final. Did, were you surprised that they didn't play in between you and the goals? A um, lot? No, look, um, uh, I'm, I'm very proud, and this leads into the stats story, yeah, you know, yeah. wanted to know more about, you know, what happened. I, I think, you know, even my junior coaches would tell you something like front and square, you know, look, your mm. best chance is to get in front of the, oh. the contest if you're a rover, you see. And actually, um, Several coaches, Dennis Pagan, some others, have always come up and said, I, I, I watched you play in, um, uh, you know, that grand final, and really that's when I got this idea of front and square, you know, to, yeah. to sort of be in my coaching um, menu. Yeah. And uh, I think I did that pretty well on the day, and I think others did it. Look, it wasn't unique, but it was just so spectacular. So those first goals, I think, Stands were... Teddy, yeah. you had a big hand in the victory, there's no doubt about that. Did you have a celebration? You had a few, you had a few drinks for sure after that victory. Well, uh, you know, you get surprised by just the how monumental it is when you win. You're yeah. never prepared for that, are you? You know, just the reaction of the public, yeah, your fellows and all that. Um, I, I must say, you know, one of the things that... Um, interests me is the way they celebrate now, not just after you win a grand final, but after you kick a bloody goal in the yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so I don't know why players get <laughs> so excited. In the book, in the book, yeah, in the book there, there, yeah, the, the is there, is there, is there a done. section on how many high fives you can give after you kick the goal? <laughs> That's right, yes. There yeah. it is. Just tell us briefly, uh, AFL prospectus, what's in it? Oh, well, what we uh, look at is, first of all, each team gets a profile, you know, just trying to understand how they play using evidence or the numbers. And it's, it's quite often we use a lot of very advanced science, but you've got to be very uh, basic in what you communicate. So we, our job is to bring all the numbers, the complexity of them, into simple messages that, you know, uh, the supporters or the commentators, players, coaches can understand. Um, then what we have is 701 of the, the current listed players and we give them a, a very comprehensive table with all the stats laid out. So you can actually see their progress over five years as they've had five years in the caper. Or for the recruits, um, so, which is very important. We actually now look at their, um, you know, um, uh, under 18 competition profiles and we mm. try and give evaluations on and with the 701 players like we just don't make it all sort of boring tables mm. um, there's some very interesting comments in each of the players you know about mm. how they're progressing so you might look at a player like James Hurd and numbers wise um, you know his career is in um, serious decline at the moment Mm. Don't tell the Essendon supporters no. that. Well, Dougie was going to read it. He thought the AFL was going into gold mining for his <laughs> prospectus, so it, uh, it didn't work that way, Doug, did it? <laughs> Tony, I take umbrage of those comments. <laughs> with, with the fish. <laughs> Ted, uh, I've got a copy of this book. It is a yeah, fantastic is book, and uh, I recommend to people if, uh, if they want to know, you you know what's happened to your players bookshop. and your club over the last five years, you get a copy of this. All yeah. good uh, bookstores, I take it? Yeah. yeah, off the internet, news yeah. agents. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very good. And I'm very proud to be associated with it because it's, it's giving back to football. Like, you know, the story is I retired early from football, but that's uh, for other personal reasons. It's yeah. just um, uh, we're back in football with champion data and now this book. You're not really a bad Ted, bloke either. Thanks for joining <laughs> us on Grumpy Old Men. Uh, certainly one of the yes. greats of AFL football, yeah, a special boy. part in history. Catch us next week as we look.